Church of the Living God. Brethren, get your authorized version of the scriptures and turn with me in the scriptures to Proverbs chapter 16. Did you read Proverbs 16 today? It is the 16th. Proverbs chapter 16, verses 1 under verse 10. Please follow me along in the scriptures. The preparations of the heart in man and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Is your heart prepared to do the things of the Lord? Is your heart prepared to speak as the Lord would have you to speak? All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes. But the Lord weigheth the lowercase s spirits. Something could seem very right unto you because it's always been that way. And then go about in that spirit, <laughs> trying to justify yourself. But we have to remember, the Lord's the one who weigheth the spirits. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. Hold your place here, and this one you can very readily and easily cross-reference with Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 on to verse 7. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. <laughs> Be not wise in thine own eyes. Fear the Lord, and depart from evil. And amen. Pride. Pride, I believe, unto the Lord is one of the greatest of evils. Pride has got one of his uh, most beautiful creations kicked out. Of course, I'm talking about Lucifer, because Lucifer, remember, is a created being. Verse 3 again in Proverbs chapter 16. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. Are our works that we do as the Church of the Living God committed unto the Lord? Or half-heartedly that we ourselves may have something to gain by the work that we have been called to do unto the Lord? And using that as a crutch just to further ourselves? Hmm. The Lord hath made... All things for himself, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. Now, even the wicked for the day of evil, what does that mean? For judgment. Look around outside your door sometime. Oh, what, you haven't been doing that lately because you've been distracted, right? <laughs> yeah, you've been distracted. What is there that... The devil doesn't want you to see. Have you been distracted? Are you carrying on? Hmm? But see, evil, yea, even the wicked for the day of evil. Um, wicked people are put in power as a form of judgment against those who are against the Lord. Wicked people are a tool of our Lord's judgment upon a populace or upon a person, a spirit, soul, and body. <laughs> yes. 
Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. And I, I always tell you straight up, I have a pride problem. Oh, I do. And I, as I have shared with you on many occasions, I've been given a thorn in the flesh over that pride problem. I asked for it, for humility. And the Lord does it. But when you are right about something, especially when it comes on to, say, idolatry, there will be no budging. No matter what. But nonetheless, the warning is, everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, though many people are rallying to your cause, but if it's done from pride in heart, yes, he shall not be unpunished. Do you realize sometimes that that punishment might not direct your actual person, spirit, soul, and body, or even your own mentality, but it could be around, uh, affecting those around you? You got to remember, brethren, a lot of the times when you let your pride get the best of you, it doesn't only affect yourself, it affects others, especially those you love. Especially those you love. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. What is truth? Pilots, age-old question. What is truth? Jesus Christ, he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by him. Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word, the scriptures, not the Bible. See, distinction, distinction. <laughs> Talking to people out there, you mention a Bible, well, which one? You make distinction. The scriptures. What is that? Oh, the King James Version. These are the scriptures. See, it's about distinction. Just had, just had to throw that in there. Especially in these times. That's, personally, that's what I'm all about. Distinction. Because Satan, through his Christians in church buildings, and, of course, the Christians of the Roman Catholic Church have brought everything together and made a mess of everything. Distinction, brethren. Distinction. By mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. And by the fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. I've never said that it's evil to refer to yourself as a Christian. I've never said that. All I've said to you is, um, I don't want any part of it because of what Satan has done to what is called Christian. And because I've experienced this myself in person with many people. You say Christian to most people? Catholics or the Celevangelists? Those are the two that come up. What about distinction? Hmm? What about distinction? And amen. The fact that you are not of this world ought to be distinction enough, yes. But you got to remember, there are evil men that have crept in unawares working for the Vatican. And look what the Vatican has done over history. Again, to this very day, you talk to a Jew about Christ, they will automatically equate that onto Catholicism. Why do you think a lot of those Jews, Hebrews, 
who are of the church of the living God. They themselves want nothing to do with the term Christian. You think about that. You let that roll around in your head a little bit. Verse 7, when a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Hmm. Do my enemies have peace with me? No. But see, the enemy, my enemies can do nothing against me unless it was given unto them of the Lord. Our Lord talks about that in uh, the book of Deuteronomy. One second, brethren. Had to go, had to get here quickly. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, our Lord addresses, uh, addresses this unto his people, the children of Israel. But see, we can use this for instruction and in righteousness for us today. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 26 on verse 34. I said I would scatter them into corners. I would make the remembrance of them to cease from among men. Were it not that I feared the wrath of the enemy lest their adversaries should behave themselves strangely, and lest they should say, Our hand is high, and the Lord hath not done all this. Now see, unto an enemy of our Lord Jesus Christ, they can get headstrong saying, Well, see, the Lord is using me. Uh, the Lord uses wicked people for judgment, for correction, for judgment, yes. Even for judgment amongst his own people. Look at Paul. When the Lord specifically told Paul, Hey, don't go to Jerusalem. What did he do? He went anyway. Look what happened to him. Okay? Look what happened to him. The Lord allowed that. Okay? And I've, I, can I remember which one it was? Uh, no, but I did. We did talk about verse twenty-seven in a video that has been done before. You know which one that is. I don't know. I have no idea. But we have talked about this before. If I can remember it, uh, or the Lord can bring it to my light, I'll put it in the description box. Okay. But see, the Lord will allow wicked people to um, act as tools of judgment in His hand against the wicked and lost themselves, but also when a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Back to Deuteronomy, verse 28. For they are a nation void of counsel, neither is there any understanding in them. Oh, that they were wise, that they, could, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. Latter end. How could one chase a thousand and two put ten thousand to flight except their capital R, Rock, had sold them and the Lord had shut them up? For their lowercase r, Rock, is not as our uppercase r, Rock. Even our enemies themselves being judges. For their vine is the vine of Sodom and of the fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. Is not this laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures? We got to read verse 35. To me belongeth vengeance. Not you. And recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time. For the day of their calamity is at hand. And the things that shall come upon them make haste. Back to Proverbs 16. <clears throat> verse, uh, verses 8 on to verse 10. Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues without right. Uh, recently, a dear friend has uh, decided to go, and that's sad. That's sad. 
but uh, hopefully everything is good and uh, as the Lord wills. But see, the point is, better is a little with righteousness than great revenues without right. The Lord is the one who still provides for us. The Lord is the one who still takes care of us. Having food and raiment therewith, let us be content. Hey, you, if you are so inclined, I have never once asked from you anything. Never. I have never asked of anything. Prayer, yeah, yeah. But hey, and you, my enemies, you, my enemies, even you can say this. I've never asked you for anything. I never have. Why is that? Better is a little with righteousness than great revenues without right. Oh, and you can always bring in the arguments about what Paul said and what not. And yes, there are valid arguments for that. Personally, I never have. The Lord is the one who is keeping us afloat. The Lord is the one who will do. Why do some of us feel the need to pull the strings as if he doesn't? A man's heart deviseth his way. But the Lord directeth his steps. Amen. The Lord will put, like, this video today. Got a massive <laughs> video in waiting uh, dealing with Abraham's seed. That's going to be a big video, two-parter. It's going to be an expository video, actually. But, um, you know, we were able to talk with a beloved brother, a really good friend of ours, of both myself and my wife. A really good friend of ours from out north, from northeast, um, who's just going through some incredible times right now. And the Lord is blessing him. And the Lord is using it. I'm going to need, um, I'm not going to use his name because of, uh, I don't want the enemies going after him. But there is a brother from the northeast whose brother is very sick right now, whose brother um, is of the Church of the Living God. Um, keep him in your prayers. He's going through a lot right now. And we all need prayer because we are all going through a lot right now, aren't we? Tis the season to be distracted think we need to move on, brethren, don't you? Verse 10. A divine sentence is in the lips of the king. His mouth transgresseth not in judgment. And of course, our Lord Jesus Christ said, the things I speak, I don't speak of myself, meaning coming from the flesh, okay? Meaning, remember, the Godhead is spirit, soul, and body. And about the body, <laughs> okay, the word was made flesh. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. God was manifest in the flesh, okay? The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, these three are one, okay? Okay? But our Lord said, it's not me that speaks, but the Father from the soul that speaks. That's terribly brad eyes. Okay? But a divine sentence is in the lips of the king, who is the king, our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. His mouth transgresseth not in judgment, and his judgments are right, fair, and equal. All these things are very good and healthy to have in your remembrance when it comes to certain things within our lives as the Church of the Living God. But as I have spake with you before, when you add death into the equation, 
whether it is yourself that gets a brush with death, as I have this year, at this very spot, kneeling upon my knees, Or the death of a loved one that might be looming. See, death changes everything, doesn't it? See, now you and I, I I've, I've talked to you about this before, but people! We as the Church of the Living God, we know that we are going to die and that when we die, we are going to go and be with the Lord. Amen. Alleluia. But <laughs> to speak of it brazenly and nonchalantly, this, well, it's going to happen anyway. Yes, it is. But when it comes upon you that, hey, guess what? That could be right now. A dear friend of ours had asked the question, how do people fear the Lord? I personally believe that let them taste death. Let them taste death. Let their hearts stop. And you're... And then the Lord in mercy, oh, oh, chest pounding, arms numb. Yeah. Yeah. And like I said, we, we have the church of the living God. We know where we're going. But when it comes, knock, knock, knocking at your door. We're not to be afraid of death, no. But the, the reality is, wow, when, it ha when, that cat, when, that, when you are in that type of a situation, it's like, oh, wow, here it is. Nothing to be afraid of if you're saved, converted, born again of the church of the living God, a new creature in Christ Jesus. Remember, false converts can have a whole lot of change. There's a difference between merely having a changed life and being a new creature. But like I've told you, and I can speak to you about this, because this year I've been there. It changes your perspective. We know we're going to die. But like I said, when it comes, that it might be at that very moment. Hmm. It changes things. It ought to. Brother up north said to me, there's something seemed different in you. Well, yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of course. Because like I said, we all know we're going to die. But when it might actually happen that very day, even though you know, even though you know here, even though you know here, it's like, wow, wow, here it is. Psalm 39. Psalm 39. Are you in the Psalms at all? Are you in the Psalms at all? Do you read Psalms daily? Life is in the Psalms, dear people. Think about it. See, you, the Lord saves you, and you are of the church of the living God, a new creature in Christ Jesus. You read the New Testament. Yes. You read the Pauline epistles. That's Specific doctrine for us today in this dispensation. Yes, you read that. Absolutely. That's our that's our go-to stuff for today, for doctrine for today, absolutely, in the Pauline epistles. Okay? Specifically. You don't discard the entirety of the New Testament. No, of course not. 
But our doctrine for us today in this dispensation is specifically found within the Pauline epistles. Remember, before the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, that was still technically the Old Testament because the perfect atonement for sins had yet to be made. Okay? But once the Lord saves you, you're in the, Old, uh, you're in the New Testament, reading the New Testament, learning of our Lord. Okay? Learning of Him. Learning what he expects of you for today, okay? And to prepare you that the man of God may be thoroughly uh, furnished, perfect unto all good works. I just Bradized that. Beg your pardon. But when you think about it, life is in the Psalms. Think about this. Seriously. And if you're a babe, okay, look, look at the very first Psalm, okay? The very first song, a psalm, talks about, you know, the blessings of the godly. All right? And then the second psalm talks about why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? Who's in control? See, the first psalm talks about how you're blessed by being of the church of the living God. For our instruction and in righteousness, obviously. <laughs> and remembering in the second psalm, who reigns? Who's the king? Hmm? The third psalm talks about how the Lord's going to protect his own. And the fourth psalm of though some evil things may befall you here in this life, you're safe in the Lord. You're going to heaven when you die. And the fifth psalm talks about how God hates wickedness. You're a new convert of the church of the living God. Read the New Testament. Don't neglect the psalms. Because life is in the psalms too. Absolutely. <laughs> Again, it begins with the blessings of those who are of the church of the living God, the godly. Remember, that's for instruction in righteousness, okay? <laughs> okay. And the second psalm, the Lord is king. God is king. God will reign, okay? And the third psalm, God protects his own. The fourth psalm, you're safe in the Lord if you are truly saved, born again, converted to the church of the living God. The fifth psalm, God hates the wicked. Life in the Psalms. Read the Psalms, people. Granted, it's some of there in the Psalms is for specific the uh, dispensation of the law, but a lot of instruction and in righteousness for us also in the Psalms. Don't neglect the Psalms. Psalm thirty-nine, verses four under verse six. Lord, make me to know mine end and the measure of my days, what it is, that I may know how frail I am. See, we know, we know, we know that we know. We know that we know that when we die, we're going to be with the Lord. But isn't there just a little hint in you thinking that you're, that while you're here, that you're immortal, Right? Oh, don't tell me otherwise. I'll call you a, I, I call you a liar to your face. Not talking about not being afraid because we're not to fear death. It's just when it, when your time's up. Behold, thou hast made my days as an hand breath. And mine age is as nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best state is all together vanity. At your best state, your vanity, useless, meaningless. Surely every man walketh in a vain shoe. Like, like Shakespeare, who dance and struts his stuff upon a stage to be heard of no more. It is the tale told by an idiot. 
full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. Surely every man walketh in a vain shoe. Surely they are disquieted in vain. He heapeth up riches, and knoweth not who shall gather them. My father is a millionaire. He'd be the first one to tell you. He's heaped all that stuff up. And when he dies, it's probably all, all going to go to a Christian church organization. Ultimately back to the Vatican. Remember, people, you came into this life naked, and you're going to go out naked. Psalm 71. Psalm 71. Verses 12 on to verse 20. Verses 12 on to verse 20. Psalm 71. O God, be not far from me. O my God, make haste for my help. Let them be confounded and consumed that are adversaries to my soul. Let them be covered with reproach and dishonor that seek my hurt. I don't wish that upon any of my enemies. But I know what the Lord has called me to do. <laughs> and to call me lost because I'm against pagan idolatry. <laughs> uh, but I will hope continually and will yet praise thee more and more. My mouth shall shew forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day, for I know not the numbers thereof. Oh, boy. Look at that verse. Don't look at me. Look at the scriptures. My mouth shall shew forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day can't believe the Lord saved me of all people, the worst of the worst, a sinner who is chief. I can blame no one for any shortcomings in my life. I can blame no one for anything that's happening in my life except one. Me. I am the man. Some, like my, uh, some might like to argue about Job, and that is a valid argument. But see, at the end of the day, See, son, you've got to remember, thou art the man. And until you reach a point where you can't, where you refuse to blame other people and take full responsibility and accountability for yourself. You're going to have problems. And the only answer for you in knowing that it's the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thine help. Oh, you have destroyed yourself, but in the Lord is your help. He might not deliver you from the physical things that are going on in your life, but in him only is your help. Because when you get right down to it, vain is the help of man. If the Lord's not going to help you. How vain is it to try to manipulate? My mouth shall shew forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day. I've heard some of these Christians talk about as if they were a prize to behold that the Lord saved them. They bless themselves. They praise themselves through the Lord. I, I can't, I, I don't want to tell you how many of times I've seen that. Then what happens? If they're of the church of the living God, the Lord 
knocks them down a little bit. Amen. Amen. See, like I've told you, the difference is someone will boast themselves through the Lord as if they were a catch to behold. Oh, Lord gave me all this because I have this, because I do this. The Lord gave me this because look at me, look at me. So because I'm doing all this for the Lord, yeah, he's going to give me all this stuff because I'm so great. Makes you want to vomit. And then you meet those of the church of the living God. I can't believe that the Lord has done anything for me. The Lord saved me. The Lord has saved me. Brad Paul Avenshine, a sinner who is chief. And he has done great things for us, of all people. He has done great things for me, for my wife. It, it baffles me. You know, do you ever get like that? Lord, well, why are you so kind to me? Why, like Peter said, depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. You ever get like that? Or are you afraid to say that, um, thinking that he might? That's the difference. And personally, okay, the online thing, eh, but personally, I've run into a lot of Christians who have been there, done that. They have that, been there, done that mentality. And it always seems to turn about some way or another that they end up boasting themselves through the Lord. As I ask people who I have contact with uh, and via email, tell me how the Lord has blessed you. Don't tell me about how you are blessed by the Lord. Tell me how the Lord has blessed you. There's a difference. Do you know that difference? My mouth shall shoot forth thy righteousness and thy salvation all the day. Why? For I know not the numbers thereof. I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of thy righteousness, even thine only. There's nothing good in me. Nothing good in me. That is, in my flesh. There's nothing good in me. It is of the Lord's mercy that I draw breath. It is today our Lord's mercy that we have a roof over our head, that we have uh, electricity and stuff like that. We don't know what tomorrow will bring. Hmm. I will go in the strength of the Lord God. I will make mention of thy righteousness, even thine only. O God, thou hast taught me from my youth, and hitherto have I declared thy wondrous works. Now also, when I am old and gray-headed, O God, forsake me not until I have shewed thy strength unto this generation and thy power to every one that is to come. As Paul said, I have finished the course. I have fought a good fight. See, in Paul's end, it was all about how the Lord did, not how he did through the Lord. And when you have someone, wh whomever it is, and I'm not specifically talking about anyone, okay? Let's grow up, people, okay? Let's grow up a little bit, okay? But when you have people who have been there, done that, who are the gray-headed, who are supposed to teach the youth, those I'm speaking in terms of the Church of the Living God. They want to throw over them the lordship of their um, eldership, so to speak. 
And yes, you know, babes, you know, there, there's an order, you know, absolutely. Paul talks about that, you know, how the younger are su to submit unto the elder. Amen. But the elders are not supposed to lord it over them. And you get a lot of this in the church buildings, okay, from the Christians. You get a lot of that. <laughs> you got a lot of that. Verse 19, thy righteousness also, O God, is very high. Who has done great things, O God? Who is like unto thee? Thou which hast shewed me great and sore troubles, thou shalt quicken me again and shalt bring me up again from the depths of the earth. And psalm 75. Psalm 75 is the middle psalm. As we looked in the beginning of the book of Psalms, that life is in the Psalms, from the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth Psalm, how it's very good instruction in righteousness to begin with the Psalms for someone who is newly saved at the Church of the Living God. The middle of the way, the middle of your life as, a, as of the Church of the Living God, 75th Psalm. What is it? Verse 1. Unto thee, O God, do we give thanks. Unto thee do we give thanks, for that thy name is near, thy wondrous works declare. Verse 2. When I shall receive the congregation, I will judge uprightly. Can you handle reading this whole song with me? Come on, let's go. The earth and all the inhabitants thereof are dissolved. I bear up the pillars of it. Shilah. I said unto the fools. Now see, midway in your life, in your walk with the Lord as of the church of the living God, the first five psalms deal with those who are newly of the church of the living, living God, talking about instruction and righteousness, okay? Okay? We do know what that is, right? Okay? But the first five psalms especially, Deal with those in context of those who are just beginning. This is the middle of the way. After you've been through a couple battles. After you have eaten what the Lord has given you and ingested it. And have been taught by the Lord. I said unto the fools, deal not foolishly. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Deal not foolishly, living and acting as if there is no God. And to the wicked, lift not up the horn. See, verse 4 there. This is the middle psalm. The middle of the road. Okay? When the Lord decides that you have reached a point in your walk with him, that you are to start. And this, you know, we're all in the ministry of reconciliation. Okay? We are all ambassadors unto Christ. We all have the word, the authorized version of the scriptures. Okay? We all have the word of reconciliation of the church of the living God. But a babe is not going to go out there, month old, maybe not even a year old, and get into deep things. The Lord can use a babe for that. Absolutely. I'm not saying that he can't. Of course not. But see, things come with time. Time and repetition. Repetition is good. Repetition is good. Okay? Until the Lord deems you. It's like, okay, I'm going to orchestrate something and I want to use you for it. Verse 5. And, and right here. Lift not up your horn on high. Speak not with a stiff neck. For promotion cometh neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south. Hmm. Interesting to know, note. East, west, west, south. No north. Hmm. A little on that. Read Ezekiel chapter 14, verses 12 on verse 15 about the significance of the north. The context of that is, of who's talking about it, is like, I will sit in the sides of the congregation of the north. North is... Upward? I'm just saying. 
Okay? Let's continue. But God is judge. He putteth down one and setteth up another. This does not belong to me. Never did, never will. It's of the Lord. He's the only one who's going to either continue it or stop it. Not you. Even though you will try. It's up to the Lord. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup. And the wine is red, it is full of mixture, and he poureth out of the same. But the dregs thereof, all the wicked of the earth, shall wring them out and drink them. But I will declare forever, I will sing praises to the God of Jacob. All the horns of the wicked also will I cut off, but the horns of the righteous shall be exalted. And who is righteous when the Lord declares right? Not because you're a thief and a robber and climbed up some other way and said you were. Or that there was, that you were a prize in some way that the Lord just absolutely had to save you because you were worth it. Psalm 90. Psalm 90. Verses 9 on to verse 12. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. The days of our years are three score years, two, four, six, and ten. Two, four, six, three score, ten, seventy. Yet if they be, yet is their strength, labor, and, uh, where is it? I just, excuse me. The days of our years are three score years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be four score years, two, four, six, eight, eighty, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Remember, God put a time limit in the book of Genesis on man's lifespan. And no, it wasn't immediately. Of course not. It was a gradual depleting, depleting of years onto man. They were living up to almost a thousand years old. Then seven, then six, then five, then three, then two. Okay? God put a restraint on the years of man's life, 120. There were some that were exceptions to that. Yes. But... In reality, especially nowadays, man's mortality rate is just that. Is just that. The days of our years are three score years and ten. And if reason, and if by reason of strength they be four score years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger? Even according to thy fear, so is thy wrath. Here's the admonition. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. And what is wisdom? The fear of the Lord. That is wisdom. And what is understanding? To depart from evil. In the middle of the way we saw in Psalm 75. Right here in Psalm 90. Verse 12. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. You know, of what I read the, of the scriptures daily with our Lord, and he's constantly showing me all kinds of things. I've, wow. Um, the constants, no matter what, are always the Psalms and the Proverbs. You need to be more intimate with the scriptures. If you're a babe... Yes, spend your time in the New Testament, absolutely. But remember, don't neglect the Old Testament. And don't relegate it to just reading the Psalms and Proverbs, okay? You want a good way to learn how to live in the fear of the Lord as the church of the living God? Read the Old Testament. 
And yet, in the Old Testament, that was a majority of it was under the law. But I know that. One of these days, there ought to be a video, Lord willing, about instruction and in righteousness. Because for some people, they like to make to confuse what that is. Keep that in mind. But okay. Middle of the way. The middle of our walk. When the Lord has, you know, when we have, when the Lord have, thinks we have re reached a certain point with him or whatever. Middle of the way. We're telling the fools, don't ask foolishly. You repent. You, you got to stop doing that. You got to go to the Lord on his terms, not your own. Broken, oh, fine. You know, I hear that. Okay, fine. Go to the next one. The middle of the road. And remember, the number five is associated with death. I find it very interesting. As we are to leave and go to be with the Lord, those who are of the church of the living God, those who are saved, is it not, I find this very interesting, the last five psalms, we saw the, we, read them yourself, the first five psalms all deal with infancy in a beginning walk with the Lord. Okay? Okay? You know, blessed is the man, uh, blessed is the godly, okay? And what was it? Uh, the Lord uh, the Lord reigns, uh, um, uh, and the Lord you're safe, and the other one I forget, and the fifth one, God hates wickedness. Uh, the 75th Psalm, okay? Being used of the Lord. He put up one, uh, he, he set up one and take down another, okay? Declaring the Lord's righteousness, all the while numbering our days. Last five Psalms. Psalm 146, 147, 148, 149, 150. What do all these have in common? How do they begin? Praise ye the Lord. Psalm 146. Verse 1. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye and praise the Lord, O my soul. Psalm 147. Verse 1. Praise ye the Lord, for it is good to sing praises unto our God. For it is Pleasant and praise is comely. Psalm 148. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord from the heavens. Praise him from, praise him in the heights. Psalm 149, verse 1 again. Praise ye the Lord. Sing unto the Lord a new song and his praise in the congregation of saints. The last psalm. Verse 1, praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise the Lord. So, see, in the book of Psalms, people, it begins in an infancy. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsels of the ungodly. Okay? You're saved, born again, converted of the church of the living God? Read the New Testament. Learn of our Lord Jesus Christ. Don't neglect the Psalms. Your babe, you're recently saved of the Church of the Living God. Read the, read the New Testament. Read the Gospel accounts. Also the Pauline. Read the whole thing. Okay? Absolutely. No man can tell you how to read Scripture. There's only one who can. Okay? That's the Lord, by the way. But I recommend never forget or neglect the psalm. I know of people out there who do not read or spend any time in the Old Testament. You are crippling yourself. You are, oh, wow, you are crippling yourself. Uh, have you not already noticed <laughs> that we have yet to be in the New Testament? See, the longer that I walk with the Lord, the more I'm drawn to the Old Testament. Go to Isaiah chapter 65. Isaiah chapter 65. See, like I told you, we who are saved of the church of the living God, we know where we're going to go when we die. We have no fear of death. 
But again, I submit unto you. <laughs> Unless you're going to decide to chomp on a bullet or do some dumb thing like decide to get, you know, indulge in something that kills you. It's always going to be a shock upon you when your time is up. It's like, wow. Those who have wives and children of the church of the living God. Wow. I'm coming to be with you, Lord, but my wife. And see, with what's going on right now and what's coming, that was my fear. Not to die and be before the Lord. Absolutely not. But I have a wife that needs me. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 65, verses 1 and verse 7. I am sought of them that ask not for me. I am found of them that sought me not. Making reference on to how the children of Israel were supposed to be the ones doing that. I said, Behold me, behold me unto a nation that was not called by my name. And of course, Israel, called by his name. I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people, which walketh in a way, which walketh in a way that was not good after their own thoughts. A people that provoketh me to anger continually to my face, that sacrificeth in gardens, and burneth incense upon altars of brick. Put this into a modern context for our instruction in righteousness. These Christians, these Christians, this is why I am not a Christian, and I want nothing to do with the term Christian. Not at all. I'm not a Christian. I'm of the church of the living God. We won't get off on that. But the ones who are labeled as Christian, the ones who call themselves Christian, are the ones that are supposed to adhere to the scriptures. But then again, they have a multitude of Bibles that don't say the same thing, and yet they can be as the world to win the world. And they're in church buildings for today is not according to scripture. A people, verse 3, a people that provoketh me to anger continually to my face, that sacrificeth in gardens, and burneth incense upon altars of brick. And you read in the scriptures, altars were to be of stones, where there was no iron lifted upon them, lest they would uh, profane them. Okay? Verse 4. Which remain among the graves and lodge in the monuments, which eat swine's flesh and broth of abominable things is in their vessels. Remember, this was under the dispensation of the law. Okay? Which say, stand by thyself. Come not near to me. I am holier than thou. And what does the Lord say of those who think they're better than everybody else? Yeah, these are smoke in my nose, a fire that burneth all the day. We'll leave that one alone. Behold, it is written before me, I will not keep silence, but will recompense with an S, even recompense into their bosom. Remember, recompense with an S is a verb. Recompense with a C is a noun or adjective. M Mr. Webster done botched that one. Good. Hey, don't believe me? I've, I've, there was a video that this was covered in before as well. I <laughs> can't remember. But you look at Webster, it's, it's an S. God makes a distinction. Oh, boy. Imagine that in his word. Fact check me on that. I dare you. Verse 7, your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together, saith the Lord, which have burned incense upon the mountains and blasphemed me upon the hills. Therefore, I will measure their former work into their bosom. You got to read what you saw. And 
and see the Lord will use circumstance. If you're of the church of the living God and you're messing around and the Lord brings something upon you, whether you personally or in your personal life, you need to really take consideration. You really need to take consideration of what you may have started. And we also got to remember, brethren, and again, here I, I've um, there's been video a video where this was covered before. If you, if you watch a video that the Lord has given me to do at random, and then you watch like a newer one and the same, I can't remember in the videos that the Lord has given me to do. I got all the notes, by the way. Can I find which one was which? Well, absolutely not. It's only until recently I started putting like, hey, dummy, you ought to put the name of the video on there so you can find them, you know? <laughs> but um, I can't remember oh, everything that I've said in videos. I can't. I can't remember. It's like, wow, have I, have, Lord, have we talked about this in a video? So if you find anything like that, keep that in mind, okay? Okay, please. It's, it's kind of hard to keep track. But Amos chapter 4. Amos chapter 4. Might have covered this in uh, Let Us Reason Together. I might have. But we're going to cover it today. Because God will give you, lost person, every opportunity. See, you're lost. The Lord has given you and is giving you. You can, You got today? <sighs> you have a chance. The Lord has given you today to come to Him. And if you're of the church of the living God, you got to remember the admonition, the warning in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. You mess around, you can be handed over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Okay? But Amos chapter 4, Verses 6 on to verse 12. For instruction in righteousness, of course. But you got to remember this. See, God will do things to get your attention. And the brother that I made mention of, um, his brother was not doing too good. Keep him in prayer. But even in this uh, man's poor state, God is using him to reach those around him. See, God will use circumstance, not only for you, but for others. Amos chapter 4, verses 6, on to verse 12. And verse 13. I also have given you cleanness of teeth in all your cities, and want and want of bread in all your places. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. No food. He's taken away your food. But yet you haven't returned to him. Lost people. He's taken away this, that, or the other, and you're not going to him. And also I have withholden the rain from you. When there were yet three months to the harvest, and I caused it to rain upon one city, and caused it not to rain upon another city. One piece was rained upon, and the piece whereupon it rained not withered. So, verse 6, cleanness of teeth, and want of bread, no food. Verse 7, taking away the ability to make food, because of no rain. Verse 8, so two or three cities wandered unto one city to drink water. But they were not satisfied. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. So it takes away your food, the ability to get food. You got to go over here to get it, but yet it doesn't satisfy you. Hmm. Kind of like the famine that is eventually going to come upon America. Make a monopoly got to go to one place like Walmart. Yeah. And you see the second occurrence. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. Verse 
I have smitten you with blasting and mildew. When your gardens and your vineyards and your fig trees and your olive trees increased, the palmer worm devoured them. Yet, have you not returned unto me, saith the Lord. So, you've got all this stuff, but yet the palmer worm, palmer worm, that eats these things. Hmm. But and look what he says again. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. About this, about this, hold your place here. Hold your place here. Joel chapter 1. Joel chapter 1. Verses 4 under verse 12. Hold your place in Amos. Joel chapter 1 verses 4 under verse 12. That which the palmer worm hath left hath the locust eaten. And that which the locust hath left hath the canker worm eaten. And that which the canker worm hath left, hath the caterpillar eaten. When God wants to devastate somebody, he's very effective at doing it. When God cuts off all ties, you are alone in the midst of the sea with only him as your help. You have destroyed yourself, but your help is only in the Lord. Awake, ye drunkards, and weep and howl, all ye drinkers of wine, because of the new wine, for it is cut off from your mouth. For a nation is come up upon my land, strong and without number, whose teeth are the teeth of a lion. No marvel, Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. And the devil walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. People out there that are lost, are taken in the snare of the devil, devil and are taken by it at his will. Hmm. Whose teeth are the teeth of a lion, and he hath the cheek teeth of a great lion. He hath laid my vine waste, and barked my fig tree. He hath made it clean bare, and cast it away. The branches thereof are made white. Kind of sounds like what Catholicism does, doesn't it? Lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. The meat offering and the drink offering is cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests, the Lord's ministers mourn. The field is wasted. The land mourneth, for the corn is wasted. The new wine is dried up. The oil languisheth. Be ye ashamed, O ye husbandmen. Howl, O ye vine dressers. For the wheat and for the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. The vine is dried up, and the fig tree languisheth. The vine. Jesus is the vine. Okay, we are the branches. Jesus does not dry up. But if you don't go to the Lord, and because you don't go to the Lord and don't seek him, the fig tree languisheth. So, and remember, the fig tree is always synonymous with Israel. So Israel not going to their Lord, their God, their King? Hmm. The pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree. Even all the trees of the field are withered, because joy is withered away from the sons of men. Now, note the use of the language of trees. Okay? Again, the vine. He is the vine, our Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Fig tree, synonymous with Israel. Um, the palm tree, the apple tree. These are types of peoples, ands, or nations. Even all the trees of the field are withered because joy is withered away from the sons of men. I have heard, and I can't verify this, that the fig tree in verse 12 Shem, the palm tree, Ham, the apple tree, Japheth. 
And when you look at it like that, and then it says, even all the trees of the field, the descendants of those three trees. Hmm. Something for you to think about. And also, keeping, keeping your place there in uh, Amos, go to Haggai. Oh, go to Haggai! <laughs> Haggai chapter 1, verses 3, on to verse 11. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste? Now granted, remember, this is for a different dispensation. This is for instruction in righteousness that we are looking at. Instructing us on how we are to adhere to the scriptures by example. Okay? Now, what does this mean for our instruction in righteousness? Is it time for you to take care of your own hide and not to seek the Lord in all things? Hmm? Are you neglecting the Lord so you can live your best life now? Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Ye have sown much and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build a house, and I will take pleasure in it. And I will be glorified, saith the Lord. Go up to the mountain. Go to the Lord. Bring wood. He died on the cross for you. Okay? You are the... When you go to the Lord, you're like, Lord, I'm nothing. <laughs> I'm nothing. I have nothing to offer you. Go to the Lord. Ye look for much. And lo, it came to little. And when ye brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts? Because of mine house that is waste. And ye run every man unto his own house. Again, he's talking about the temple. Instruction and righteousness. You're, you're worried about your, your own little personal life, but yet neglecting your life with the Lord. Is that the case for some of you? Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains, and upon the corn, and upon the new wine, and upon the oil, and upon that which the ground bringeth forth, and upon men, and upon cattle, and upon all the labor of the hands. And see, he says for us to consider our ways. Well, he was saying it to Israel, but to instruct us today if we're messing up or if you're not saved. Back in Amos chapter 4, verse 10. I have sent among you the pestilence after the manner of Egypt. After the manner of Egypt. Pestilence of the world. Your young men have I slain with the sword and have taken away your horses and have made the stink of your camps to come up onto your nostrils. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. I have overthrown some of you, as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And ye were as a firebrand plucked out of the burning. Yet have ye not returned unto me, saith the Lord. What hast thou to do to take my words in your mouth? Psalm 50, I just brad eyes that, beg your pardon. How long are you going to mess around with the Lord until he has to take action and do what he would rather not to you because you are the one who's being stubborn? Verse 12 is the scary part. 
Therefore thus will I do unto thee, O Israel. And because I will do this unto thee, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. We can meet the Lord in prayer, but to meet him actually, physically? Hmm. When we of the church of the living God, when we die, we're going to go to the judgment seat of Christ. You who are lost, you're going to be judged at the great white throne. So, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. You're going to die. How many times? Verse 6. Yet have ye not returned unto me. Verse 8. Yet have ye not returned unto me. Verse 9. Yet have ye not returned unto me. Verse 10. Yet have ye not returned unto me. Verse 11. Yet have ye not returned unto me. Oh, you devils. See, someone who has made their choice, you, you can't reach these people. That's, that's for the Lord to do. But there are people who have gone past that line of no return. I know a lot of you don't like to accept that, but there are devils out there. I can name of one. I could think of one specifically who is so far gone that can't come back because their choice has been made. There are people like that. Are you to pray for those people who have made their choice and are purposely enemies of the Lord? And Jeremiah, Jeremiah, uh, the Lord said unto Jeremiah, pray not for these people because my mind cannot be towards these people. Why? Because they have chosen the abominations that he hates and their hearts are after that. And they have gone so far that they cannot return. Verse 13 in Amos chapter 4. For lo, he that formeth the mountains and createth the wind and declareth unto man what is his thought. How does he do that? Through the scriptures. That maketh the morning darkness and treadeth upon the high places of the earth. The Lord, the God of hosts, is his name. Go to 2 Kings. Go to 2 Kings. Well, my wife and I were talking to this dearly beloved brother of ours, a friend of ours, a friend of ours. I said unto my wife what he was talking about, about how his brother in his position being sick near death, the Lord was using him. And I said unto my wife, reminded me of Elisha. And lo and behold, one of the things that I read today in devotion to the Lord was that of Elisha here in 2 Kings chapter 13, verses 14 on to verse 25. The bulb that burns twice as bright lasts only half as long. When it comes to Elisha, not Elijah, Elijah got taken up in a whirlwind. You know, the chariots of fire. He got taken up. He didn't see death. He will see death during the time of Jacob's trouble as one of the two witnesses, uh, him and Moses, are going to come back, okay? But Elijah got taken up. And hold your place here. Go to 2 Kings chapter 2. 2 Kings chapter 2. Not 5, Brad. 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 9 on to verse 14. Okay. Elijah, when the Lord said to him, Elijah, it's like, please, Lord, let me die in um, First Kings, uh, what was it, chapter 18, I believe it was. And the Lord said, or 19, excuse me. And the Lord says, and thou shalt anoint Elisha to be prophet in thy room. And Elijah cast his mantle on him. And Elisha said unto Elijah, it's like, hey, let me go back and say goodbye to them. And Elijah's like, what I do to you? Go do what you got to do. He looked back. Mm. But 
the bulb that burns twice as bright lasts half as long. Second Kings chapter 2, verses 9 under verse 14. Let's remember this about Elisha, who was mightily used of the Lord. And it came to pass, when they were gone over, that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee, before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And then you read of the works of Elisha. Mm -hmm. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass as they still went on and talked, that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. Now note, it says about how he would be taken and how he went up. Went up, not caught up. There's a difference. Okay. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof. And remember, Elisha, Elijah, in the beginning of this, uh, uh, three bands of 50 men came to him, and the first two, he's like, said to him, If I be a man of God, let fire come down and consume thee and thy 50. And boom, came up, uh, burnt up two of them at once. A hundred men. Then the last one came up and was like, Whoa, I heard about this. Hey, yo, hey, hey man, <laughs> don't kill us. Please come. And then, and then the Lord's like, go with them. And calling uh, fire. You read the book of Revelation about the two witnesses. Okay. Verse 12 again. Big part. And Elisha saw it and cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. He took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over, hither and thither. So he got, obviously, the double portion. Now, 2 Kings chapter 13, verses 14 on to verse 25. Now, Elisha was fallen sick of his sickness whereof he died. So Elisha was sick and died. Not of old age or killed by anybody, but he died of sickness. Hmm. Hmm. The bulb that burns twice as bright lasts half as long. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him and wept over his face and said, O my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And Elisha said unto him, Note that? Do you note that? Did you see that? Yeah. And Elisha said unto him, Sick of the sickness where he would die. And Elisha said unto him, Take bow and arrows. And he took unto him bow and arrows. And he said to the king of Israel, Put thine hand upon the bow. And he put his hand upon it. And Elisha put his hands upon the king's hands. And he said, Open the window eastward. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, Shoot. And he shot. And he said, The arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria. And thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphek till thou have consumed them. So Elisha, in his sickness, is being used still of the Lord. Let's continue. And he said, Take the arrows. And he took them. And he said unto the king of Israel, Smite upon the ground. And he smote thrice, three times, and stayed. And the man of God was wroth with him and said, Thou shouldest have smitten five or six times. 
Then hadst thou smitten Syria till thou hast consumed it. Whereas now thou shalt smite Syria but thrice. He used the Lord in his weakened condition and the sickness whereof he would die. Hmm. Verse 20. And Elisha died, and they buried him. And the bands of the Moabites invaded the land at the coming in of the year. And it came to pass as they were burying a man, that behold, they spied a band of men, and they cast a man into the sepulchre of Elisha. And when, and when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived and stood up on his feet. But Hazel, king of Syria, <laughs> and that's interesting too, that he revived and stood up on his feet, that even in death, the bones of Elisha, to bring someone back to life. Talk about a double portion. But Hazel, king of Syria, oppressed Israel all the days of Jehoahaz. And the Lord was gracious unto them, and had compassion on them, and had respect unto them. Why? Because of his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the line of the Hebrew. And would not destroy them, neither cast he them from his presence as yet. As yet. Still give them a chance. You get why we're looking at this so far, right? So Hazel king of Syria died, and Ben-Hadad his son reigned in his stead. And Joash, the son of Jehoaz, took again out of the hand of Ben-Hadad, the son of Hazel, the cities, which he had taken out of the hand of Jehoahaz, his father by war. Three times did Joash beat him and recovered the cities of Israel. So even in death, even in someone's dying state, the Lord could still use you, Church of the Living God. But as we have looked at thus far, those of you who die outside of Christ, not saved, you, you will have no excuse. You will not be able to say, I never heard the true gospel. Oh, you might have heard, just believe. You might have heard, God loves everybody and God's going to save everybody. You might have heard, you got to give up all your sins and then go to the Lord. Those aren't the true gospel. Brokenness of your self-righteousness. you got to get over that self of yours. Godly sorrow. It's your fault and you can't blame anyone else. And in fear of the Lord, because without him you're going to hell, call upon the name of the Lord that he may save you. Simple. Huh. The hard part is getting over you. But if you die without the Lord, you have no excuse. Somewhere... In every man, mankind, man's life. Mankind also includes you, woman, because remember, woman means of man. Okay? No one is going to not hear the gospel. You might, well, what about children? Children, before they reach that age of accountability, whenever that is, it's up to the Lord, okay? But whenever that is, they go to heaven. Okay? Oh, murdered babies, aborted babies, they go to heaven. Okay? But if you die without Christ, you have no excuse. See, God is a just and merciful God. No one is going to be able to say, I never heard the gospel. Excluding those who die before the age of accountability, obviously. Ten-year-old is going to be able to grasp what it means that he has sinned against the Lord? I don't think so. If the Lord allows such to happen, it would be very rare that could happen, yes, but... Let's go to Luke chapter 16, verses 19 on to verse 31. Verse 31. 
There was a certain rich man, which was clothed in purple and fine linen, and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores. And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died, who having food and raiment, let us be there with content. And what is it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Man's life consists not in the things he's, he has, his possessions. Beware of covetousness. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Abraham's bosom is where those who were right with the Lord when they died, when the Lord died, buried, and rose again the third day according to the scriptures and shed his blood on the cross, opened the way to heaven. He got those from, the, from Abraham's bosom, went up into heaven. Okay, You can read about that, how Samuel was called up didn't descend, okay? The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. You know, you got these twits like Joel Osteen and these um, uh, metaphysical mind science um, uh, televangelist guys who, you know, your best life now, God wants you to have the best of everything. This is their best life now. These devil Jesuit coadjutor Catholics here, um, you devils, I hope, I hope your little G God, Satan, is providing well for you because this is the best you're ever going to get. And see, we have the church of the living God who are to live meek, to be content with food and raiment. <laughs> That's scary, but in the end of the day, but now he is comforted and thou art tormented. First Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Brother, you'll see this video. I love you. This is why I can't answer your call. <laughs> you, you, how would you know? How would you know? <laughs> you know who you are. You know who you are. That, this is why I haven't answered your first call either, brother. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Verses 13 on to verse 18. Here's a comfort for us who are of the church of the living God. My best friend, our best friend, Alexander Hartley, his auntie, our sister, went home to be with the Lord. And we will see her again. My mother died five years ago on the 24th. She went to hell. While we don't see our lost loved ones who are of the church of the living God, they're someplace better. And let us never forget this. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 on to verse 18. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Others that have no hope. This is their best life. 
They die, they're going to go in the grave and be worm food or some soap and fodder like that. There are people out there who actually believe in reincarnation. Oh boy, reincarnation, what? You're going to come back as a carnation flower? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's nonsense. See, to live foolishly is to live as if there is no God. And these cell evangelists who are implementing metaphysical mind science, like the secret, you know, name it and claim it, think it, and you can achieve it, hence your God. Okay? <laughs> they really have no hope. Because they're going to go down to the grave and be worm food, right? Guys like Joel Osteen, they know what they're doing. They know where they're going. And these devil coadjutors, they know what they're doing and they know what they're going, where they're going. <laughs> it explains a lot of their mentality and their ferocity. Verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. Sleep in Jesus. Dead! For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. Alive and remain. When the bodies start hitting the floor, you know it has now been officially over a year, at least in America, that the steel of the Jesuit Punyard has been in circulation? Are you aware of that? Hmm? One year gone, but no, you've been so, uh, uh, you, a lot of you have been so distracted by a pagan holiday. You've been distracted. Yes, it's been now over a year that in circulation in America that the steel of the Jesuit poniard has been in circulation and in people. It's been over a year now. Longer in other places of the world. But here in America, it's been over a year. You don't got that much time with your loved ones. We don't have that much time with these people who have taken the steel of the Jesuit Punyard. Remember the animal trials. Okay? Two to three, uh, what is it? Three to five years tops. Three to five years tops. And... 2022 is coming very quickly. <laughs> 14 days. 16 days. 15 days. 15 days away is 2022. Yeah, that's scary. But let's continue. Verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And you of the church of the living God, we have our loved ones, who are of the church of the living God, who died, we're going to see them again. Job chapter 42. Job chapter 42. <laughs> Job chapter 42. Verses 10. On the verse, ah, you know, Job chapter 42. Let's read this whole chapter. Oh, you're just reading scripture. Yeah, and there's a problem with that, huh? <laughs> Go away. <laughs> Run along. Job 42. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that thou canst do everything, and that no thought can be withholden from thee. Remember that, brethren, you wicked people out there. Uh -huh. 
Who is he that hideth counsel without knowledge? Therefore have I uttered that I understood not, things too wonderful for me which I knew not. Here I beseech thee, and I will speak of thee, and I will speak, excuse me, I will demand of thee, and declare thou unto me. I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear, but now mine eyes seeth thee. Wherefore I abhor myself, self-hatred, and repent in dust and ashes. From dust thou art, unto dust thou shalt return. And it was so, after that the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Elphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends. For ye have not spoken of me the thing that is right as my servant Job hath. And the shoe fits. Therefore take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams, and go to my servant Job, and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering, and my servant Job shall pray for you. For him will I accept, lest I deal with you after your folly. Giving them a chance. In that ye have not spoken of me the thing which is right, like my servant Job. So Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuhite and Zophar the Namathite went and did according as the Lord commanded them. The Lord also accepted Job. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then came there unto him all his brethren, and all his sisters, and all they that had been of his acquaintance before, and did eat bread with him in his house, and they bemoaned him and comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. Every man also gave him a piece of money, and every one an earring of gold. See, Job's three friends came to comfort him at first, and they done messed that up. But after and words before the Lord stepped in and had to rebuke Job, because Job at the end, as egged on by his three friends, um, started getting proud, proud and cocky and boasting himself. Lord, who is this who speaketh words without knowledge? But after it was all over, he brought his acquaintance onto him after all his he lost, and they comforted him. Then came there unto him all his brethren and all his sisters, and all they that had been of his acquaintance before, and did eat bread with him in his house, and they bemoaned him and comforted him over all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him. Every man also gave him a piece of money, and every one an earring of gold. So the Lord blessed the latter end of Job more than the beginning, more than his beginning. For he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels and a thousand yoke of oxen and a thousand she asses. He also had seven sons and three daughters. And he called the name of the first Jemima and the name of the second Kiza and the name of the third Karin Hafuk. And in all the land were no women found so fair as the daughters of Job. And their father gave them inheritance among their brethren. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his sons and his sons' sons, even four generations. So Job died, being old, full of days. The point we looked at there is comfort. See, Lazarus here, go back to Luke chapter 16. Lazarus, when he died, he was comforted. But the man who had his best now, life now was tormented in hell. And what we can learn from this is our comfort could be we're going to see them again. Our comfort as the church of the living God when we lose those of our, of our own who we love, even those who are of our own family who are truly saved and born again, we're going to see them again. But that still doesn't take away the sting, does it? But we have to remember that. 
when you're going through your morning. But also, what happens when these rich people die who don't know the Lord? People go after their money. They fight. I, I've, I've seen this. They go after their inheritance. They, they battle one another, uh, you know, for the will and for that kind of stuff. Jeremiah chapter 16. Of course, of course, Jeremiah. Of course, Jeremiah. Of course, Jeremiah. <laughs> of course, Jeremiah. Jeremiah 16, verses 1 on to verse 9. The word of the Lord came also unto me, saying, Thou shalt not take thee a wife, neither shalt thou have sons or daughters in this place. Why? For thus saith the Lord concerning the sons and concerning the daughters that are born in this place and concerning their mothers that bear them and concerning their fathers that begat them in this land. They shall die of grievous deaths. They shall not be lamented, neither shall they be buried. But they shall be as dung upon the face of the earth and they shall be consumed by the sword and by famine and their carcasses shall be meat for the fowls of heaven and for the beasts of the earth. For thus saith the Lord, Enter not into the house of mourning, neither go to lament nor bemoan them. For I have taken my peace from this, I have taken away my peace from this people, saith the Lord, even loving kindness and mercies. When God takes away peace, you might be, you think, you might be thinking you're scooting along really good, but when God removes his hand from you, see, you lost people. You have today. It's of the Lord's mercies that you are not consumed. But when the Lord has made you his target as his enemy. Hmm. <laughs> uh, when he has taken away peace. Even loving kindness and mercies. Now in context, this is talking about the children of Israel. Yes. Instruction and righteousness again, okay? See, God's loving kindness and mercy to you, lost person, is that you have today. You, you're not promised tomorrow. All your stuff is not going to mean anything to get a ransom for you before the Lord. Both the great and the small shall die in this land. They shall not be buried, neither shall men lament for them, nor cut themselves, nor make themselves bald for them. Neither shall men tear themselves for them in mourning, to comfort them for the dead. Neither shall men give them the cup of consolation to drink, for their father or for their mother. Thou shalt not also go into the house of feasting, nor sit with them to eat and to drink. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will cause to cease out of this place in your eyes and in your days the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness and the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride. Jeremiah chapter 22, verses 13 on to verse 23. Woe unto him that buildeth his house by unrighteousness and his chambers by wrong, that useth his, useth his neighbor's service without wages, and giveth him not for his work. Thus that, that saith, I will build me a wide house and large chambers, and cutteth him out windows, and it is sealed with cedar, and painted with vermilion, form of red. Shalt thou reign because thou closest thyself in cedar? Did not thy father eat and drink and do judgment and justice? And then it was well with him, making reference unto David, his line. He judged the cause of the poor and needy. Then it was well with him. Was not this to know me, saith the Lord? Know me. Not up here. Many people do know of the Lord up here. Living relationship with the living God. A relationship through prayer, talking unto him, 
spending time with him. I beg your pardon. Remember, it's a dialogue, not a monologue. But, fared sumptuously every day, but thine eyes and thine heart are not but for thy covetousness, and to shed innocent blood, and for oppression, and for violence to do it. Therefore thus saith the Lord concerning Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. They shall not lament for him, saying, Ah, my brother, or Ah, sister. They shall not lament for him, saying, Ah, Lord, or Ah, his glory. He shall be buried with the burial of an ass, drawn and cast forth beyond the gates of Jerusalem. Not in a specific sepulcher showing this is king so-and-so. But no, taken outside of the city as refuge. Like where our Lord was crucified outside the city of Jerusalem. Okay? Taken out there. The burial of an ass. Unimportant. While they lived sumptuously every day and went after their covetousness. Go up to Lebanon and cry and lift up thy voice in Bashan and cry from the passages for all thy lovers are destroyed. I spake unto thee in thy prosperity but thou saidest I will not hear. This hath been thy manner from thy youth that thou obeyest not my voice. The wind shall eat up all thy pastors and thy lovers shall go into captivity. Surely then shalt thou be ashamed and confounded for all thy wickedness. O inhabitant of Lebanon, that makest thy nest in the cedars, how gracious shalt thou be when pangs come upon thee, the pain as of a woman in travail. One second, brethren. Hosea 13. Verse 9. O Israel, thou hast destroyed thyself, but in me is thine help. Go back to Luke chapter 16. Verse 26. And beside all this, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which pa would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. See, the finality of hell, there's no getting out of it. It's not like a soul annihilationism, which Mr. Bullinger taught. Okay? It's not like that. And you're never going to get out. You can't go from hell to be with the Lord. Once you're there, you're there. And beside all this, verse 26, again, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. You know, Manly Palmer Hall, who wrote The Secret teaching, uh, Teachings of All Ages, The Lost Keys of uh, Masonry, Freemasonry, who has videos that you can listen to here on YouTube. You can listen to him. Uh, he was a Luciferian, okay? Knowingly worshipped Lucifer, who is Satan, okay? He in hell, burning, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Adolf Hitler is in hell, burning, where the worm dieth not, and the fire 
never quenched. All the popes of the past are in hell burning where their worm dieth not and the fire is never quenched. But I can bet you, I can bet you if I were a betting man. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. I doubt anyone in hell. Well, we, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, guys like uh, Manly Palmer Hall, who sit down there burning all angry. Remember, hell is not a place of, you know, uh, a lot of people like to tell you that hell is just being removed from the presence of the Lord. Uh, you got to read Revelation chapter 14 sometime. Uh, be, their smoke uh, goeth up forever and ever in the presence of the Lamb. <laughs> okay? Yeah. Uh, no, being in hell is not being removed from God's presence. Uh, you're there because you rejected God. And yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But those who are in hell don't want you to join them. My mother doesn't want my family to go to hell. I'm not going to hell. And hey, you, I can give a rat's rear end what you think. Thank you very much. Fortunately, I don't think I ever liked you anyway. But all my family basically is in hell that are dead. My aunts, my uncles, my mother. They don't want me to go there. And I'm not. My wife's family. They're in hell. And they don't want her to go there. And she's not. Those who are in hell don't want you there. Because it's a place of torment. Like I said, there may be some ex exceptions to that rule. Okay? But still. No one that of your family that went to hell wants you there. And when you look in the dictionary at the definition of an idiot, which is void of logic and reason, you're an idiot if you reject the truth of the gospel. Because once you're in hell, there's no getting out of it. You can't go from there to there. And all the time, I, I, a guy that I used to know for 20 years recently died as in hell himself, who believed some of the most nonsensical things. But he's in hell. And you're lost. You got people who are of the church of the living God on their deathbed warning you, trying to tell you the Lord is using them to uh, warn you. It's like, hey, you need to get saved. And you're going to scoff at that? Remember, it's been in circulation now for over a year. Four to two years tops are left on some of these people. It's not the uh, field ready. But here's the um, conundrum. Verse 29, Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Moses and the prophets. The Torah and the prophets. Torah, or Pentateuch, first five books. Moses and the prophets designates what? They have the scriptures. So, Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Faith cometh by hearing, 
and hearing by the word of God. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went on to them from the dead, they will repent. Even you lost people can figure out what and whom verse 30 is making a reference on to. That one, um, uh, what, what, what is it you say, brother? Um, that one even Fanny Crosby can see. Got it. <laughs> yeah, verse 30. Yeah, even Fanny Crosby could see that. Look at the response. See, Abraham, Abraham, and in, and in this parable, Abraham is a type of the Lord, our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, okay? In Abraham's bosom and uh, comforted, okay? That's the typology here that our Lord is using, okay? And Abraham saith unto him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. They have the scripture for us today. We have, you have the scriptures. You have people who are preaching to you the scriptures, who are telling you the true way of salvation. Never mind these twits who say, just believe, you save yourself, and you climb up another way and go to hell. Don't believe them. Please, please. Even though they sound so righteous, they're perfidious. They're perfidious. Or, or please don't believe this nonsense that there's something good in you that for the reason why Jesus died, that you're good enough for the Lord dying for, that God loves everybody even though they reject him and spit on him, but he loves everybody and everybody's going to be saved even if they don't go to him on his terms. Please don't believe that. And for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, don't believe the nonsense that you got to give this, 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 this up first and then go to the Lord. Then he saves you. You couldn't give that up. I can't give it up. You couldn't do that even if you tried, boy. Don't believe that. Repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. You're not God. You're not worth it. You deserve to go to hell, and that's where you're going to go unless you come to the Lord broken of your self-righteousness, thinking there's something I can do, thinking, oh, I'm so miserable, but it's always someone else's fault. No, son. No, son. No. Stop pointing and start pointing at yourself. And see, when you know you are the one to blame. You can't blame other people like David. He didn't blame other people. That sorrow. And, and see, you lost people, you coadjutors. I can't explain that to you. You're just going to have to go through it. Why can't I explain it to you? Because it's one of those things that godly sorrow, I can tell you, yes, you feel sorrow that for what you did to Christ that he went and died. I can say that to you till you're blue in the face. Until you have that brokenness of yourself and you feel it in your heart and you know the truth, then the fact that you're going to go to hell. Yeah. The more uglier you are to yourself, the more beautiful our Lord Jesus Christ becomes. But see, when you, when you, when you still got that little bit of yourself left, And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, 
they will repent. Again, Fanny Crosby. Aha, could not see this. Verse 31. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, if they hear not for instruction and righteousness, if they hear not the truth of the gospel from the scriptures, the authorized version of the scriptures, and where you hear of one being raised from the dead. And he said unto them, If they hear not, the, not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded. Though one rose from the dead. You know, when you boil a lot of it down, down to it, um, preaching the cross is foolishness unto those who are not saved. Because when you, I mean, <laughs> how could someone be raised from the dead after being dead for three days? It all circles around that point. In the times that we are living, people, <laughs> we, do, I, we don't have that much time left. When are we going to get caught up? I don't know. I don't know. Nobody knows. But things cannot continue on as they are for much longer. And you look about what's going on in Israel. Remember, Israel is the temperature gauge, not America. Okay? Not Europe, not Africa, Israel. Okay? And again, with, with all this nonsense that the Jesuits have created, your own mortality you need to take into consideration. So once you die, you're either going to go to be with the Lord or you're going to go to hell. Which one is it going to be, Jack? That is what is important. And that, dear brethren, is what we need to be focused on. How easy is it to forget that isn't it? Especially at this time. I. I have moved on. Because we have bigger fish to fry. How about you? How about you? If any man, if any be ignorant, let him be ignorant. And that includes willful ignorance as well, okay? That's between them and the Lord. It's on you, okay? And by the way, that's what I have always said. That is what I have always said. Who's the one taking and putting things into one's mouth? But again, I'm, I'm, I'm done with that. Brethren, you got to remember, we ain't going to be here forever and we know that. We know that. Like I told you, facing your own mortality ought to be a wake-up call for us. a lot of you. Ought to be. Even though we know what we know. And those of you who are lost. If you've got a guy on his deathbed. And all he's concerned about. Is telling you of our Lord Jesus Christ. And what you must do. How to come to him on his terms. That, he be, that you be saved by our Lord. You better listen.
But then again, you might not be persuaded if one rose from the dead, will you? God help you. It's going to be it for this video. This one was uh, pretty impromptu. Um, thank you, dear brethren. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. Thank you to all of you. There are so many of you that we pray for, and um, we hope you are all well. But we understand that these days, these times, we understand that. Thank you so much for watching this. If you do, we love you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.